Okay, folks, it's 5.30, so we're going to try to get started on time. I just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody for being here, Machias, um, to view our presentation and also just to share with us what you know. We're going to present for the first hour. Um, we'll go in order of me doing an intro, Jean doing economics, <coughs> Maria doing the environment, and Paul doing transparency, eminent domain, local rights, etc. Um, and then Matt and Jean are going to do the map portion for us. And then we're going to open it up to be kind of more of a conversation and questions. Um, my name is Chris Buchanan. Uh, I work as the statewide coordinator with Stop the East West Corridor. Stop the East West Corridor is a coalition of Maine citizens who have come together because they're worried about the lack of information about this project and the lack of transparency so far to raise awareness and um, our goal is to stop the project and you'll see why in our presentation today. And so the East West Corridor, why not? You'll see here this map, we are positioned perfectly. The concept behind the East West Corridor, according to Chin Bro, Peter Vigu, and Daryl Brown, who's the program manager, is that more stuff is going to be coming our way because of the widening of the Panama and Suez canals. And we're in a northeast gateway to have the stuff go through Maine um, and to markets in the uh, middle part of the country. Um, another part of this would be that goods in the middle part of the country or points west could move east to the ports more easily. This is another uh, map that they show in their PowerPoint where you can see these two trade regions. And you're going to hear about this from, from Jean, but this concept that there's going to be more stuff that's going to be coming through, first of all, we don't even know if that's true based on what we've seen in terms of port activity. Um, and second of all, do we want to be a throughway slash gateway for these goods to be coming through? Um, it, could, it could be anything from you know, our, our water to oil being piped along the corridor to natural gas being piped along the corridor, um, transmission lines. It's, it's hard to say what that would look like. So this is their concept that somehow Maine is going to benefit by being a gateway for these increased goods being shipped around. I'd like to point out that there already exists a rail line that runs pretty much parallel to the proposed <coughs> corridor. Um, so in terms of shipping bulk products, uh, the rail line exists. One of the reasons why the rail has been ineffective um, in the state of Maine has been because of the border crossings. Um, it's been a real challenge since border security has increased to cross the border no matter who you are, even if you're trying to ship goods internationally. We believe through all of the research that we've done and the concept of this project, um, which is an actualization of really a free trade region. We think, um, based on Chimbro's history in the region and also what business people have been talking about in terms of Plan Atlantica, which is to integrate our region um, trade resources and movement of goods by increasing our infrastructure so that we have easier access to and from ports. Um, so this is really the construction arm of that concept. And we think that more stuff from wherever it's produced the cheapest, like Asia, China, Vietnam, wherever it might be that labor is cheaper, goods are cheaper, are going to flood into Maine um, and compete with our businesses even more which is the purpose of this slide um, to show, yeah, we might have an increase of big box stores bringing in goods from other places around the world, um, but what's that going to do to our local businesses and our local economy and local product? What is it? It would be a limited access toll road. Um, it's being proposed verbally as a, as a four-lane divided highway. But in the 2008 study, it's actually a three-lane highway that they are exploring the cost of. It would be two lanes with an alternating truck lane. So we don't know. It's different what's in writing and what they're saying. Okay. 
Um, it's being called a transportation communications and utilities corridor, meaning it could be anything that the investors find profitable to run along it. Um, and in fact, in the 2008 study, it says clearly that it wouldn't be profitable as a highway. It would need public subsidy or it would need to be include utilities. It would be about 220 miles from Calus to Coburn Gore. We do not know if it would be a 2,000 foot or a 500 foot right of way. At the beginning of this proposal, the proponent said that it would be a 2,000 foot right of way all across the state. It's also in the 2008 study that it would be a 2,000 foot right of way all across the state. Um, as many of you probably know, the Stud Mill Road already has a 2,000 foot right of way, but um, they're now saying that it would be 500 feet. Either way, the interstate is 350 feet wide, and we don't know what they would do with 500 to 2,000 feet. It would allow Canadian weight limits, tandem trailers, um, and effectively be a shortcut for Canadian trucks, um, which was a big part of the initial proposal, that the toll the investors would make money because the Canadian trucks would save time cutting across Maine. They wouldn't have to worry about our weight limits or regulations that we have on our state roads. Um, verbally, multiple times now, Chimbro proponents have said that the corridor would be fenced. Um, similarly to what it looks like across the border in New Brunswick, actually. Uh, this brings up a lot of concerns for us. There are six currently planned interchanges, one at Callis, one at I-95, one at Route 15, Route 23, Route 201, and Route 16 and 27. They're proposing an additional two interchanges, one to be close to Perry, um, which they're saying would access Eastport, and one that would cross Route 9, which um, you, you can look a little closer on those maps and then when Matt and Jane do the maps, um, which they're saying could access Machias. Either way, uh, we're, we're concerned about the bypass effect that it would have on communities and also the viability of having that many interchanges in the first place. Um, in their study, they said that there would be 10 interchanges in a 1999 study that the state did, there was only one interchange. So that's really up in the air. We don't know if this would be a public-private partnership or a private project. Well, recently there was a bill about the public-private partnership law being preventing the public from accessing information. Paul's going to talk a little bit more about that. And we testified to remove it so that the public could access information about this project. Well, now they're swearing up and down this is not a PPP. This is all private just like any other all-private project. As far as we can tell, there's no legal authority for them to actually create a toll highway that is all-private. Um, we do have a lawyer looking at that, but we can't find it. And in fact, all the other transportation projects that have looked like this in other parts of the country have all been public-private partnerships because they need public subsidy. The investors need to see that the public is willing to be their bottom line. So, also up in the air. <laughs> we talked about the Northeast Trade Gateway, and we talked about some of the proponents being Peter Vigue, Darrell Brown. Um, senator Doug Thomas is from Ripley. He's the senator that proposed the feasibility study to spend $300,000 of taxpayer money to fund a study to see if this would be feasible for investors. It wasn't environmental assessment or anything. David Bernhardt of MDOT advocated for it in St. Stephen's as a Northeast Trade Gateway, and since then, MDOT has denied involvement um, as a proponent, and it's supported by the LePage administration. Sure, we're employed now, but will pyramids help the economy in the long run? Um, the environmental impact? This is a picture of the, an Alberta tar sands pipeline leak and our faux comic of a wildlife crossing, um, which are proposed to you know, mitigate the effects of the fencing. Uh, loss of rights. This is effectively inviting a David and Goliath battle into all of our communities across the state of Maine. Um, 
by having a you know huge transnational corporate presence in the state, uh, effectively cutting the state in half from Canada to Canada. Potential um, cultural impacts, you know, how will this change the state of Maine? The sign says, "Welcome to Maine." Anything for money or as life the way life should be. So, and just in general, overall, um, we don't feel like it's feasible. Um, like I said, without public subsidies, utilities, and in a world where fuel costs are rising, does it really make sense to be building another asphalt belt across the state? I've reached my time limit, so I have to cut myself off, but hopefully we can get to what we're doing in our uh, question and conversation time. Um, but we've been working on building a coalition. It's a consensus-based, um, decentralized network facilitated around working groups. And this is our contact information. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the Science Club for sponsoring this event today and to thank the University of Maine at Machias for offering us this space um, and also thank uh, the Penobscot Nation's Department of Natural Resources for preparing these beautiful maps for us that you see on the wall. Um, and just all the volunteers' time, uh, everybody sitting here and everything that's gone into this so far. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jean to talk about economics.